We've come to an epistle that many of you have already discovered is one of the most spiritual uh, epistles that is in the entire Word of God. There are many people that feel that the epistle to the Ephesians is the Mount Whitney of the mountain range of the books of the Bible. That's probably true. But as far as being spiritual, there is none that compares to the epistle to the Hebrews. There's a reason for that. You see, it's written to the Hebrews. Who were they? They were a people who had had the law for about 1,500 years. And if there ever were a people that were prepared to take a step forward with God, these people were. That doesn't mean all of them were. It's always been a remnant. And this epistle is directed to that remnant who had turned to Christ. We need to keep that in mind. And I say that because today I want to introduce a word that I have not used in our Bible teachings so far, that is, in this five-year program. It's a Bible word, by the way. It's the word dispensation. Now, it's necessary to understand what the dispensations are in the Word of God or you become hopelessly confused. I thank God for the Sunday school teacher who put into my hands a Schofield reference Bible. It opened up the Word of God for the first time to a poor theological student. Now, the word dispensation, and I'm going to be a little technical today, but I want to introduce you to the word, and then we'll go into talk about it as we go along. Theologically, the word means the distribution of good and evil by God to man. Now, that's a definition that's in Webster's Dictionary. And further, the definition is amplified, and we're told it's a system of principles, promises, and rules ordained and administered as the Christian dispensation that we are in today. And it means a specific arrangement or a provision. It means to dispense or to distribute. It means an economy. There is today a political economy. We have one in this country, and communism has a political economy, and the backbone of the political economy of Russia is atheism. That's what communism teaches. That's basic to everything. There are some in this country, some in high places, that are trying to change our government today. We are a nation under God. George Washington said that you could not rule this nation without the Bible. That may be the real problem in Washington today. That's the problem with Democrats and Republicans. That's the problem with the entire crowd. This is the year of the Bible, and we haven't overemphasized it for the simple reason we emphasize that every year we go through the Bible. But they're suing the president today for that. And may I say to you, these in high places are attempting to make America an atheistic nation. That is, but this nation was built actually on the Word of God. Those who came here at first, they came here to find a place that they might worship God. What sought they thus afar, bright jewels of the mind, the spoils of war? They sought a faith's pure shrine. That's the reason that they came to this country. Now, I want us to see how the Bible uses the word dispensation. It's a word that's hated in some quarters by the church. I graduated from a seminary my denominational seminary, where the Schofield Bible was forbidden and it was ridiculed. May I say to you that the word dispensation is a very important word, and therefore 
it is a word that we need to know about because it actually, in one sense, is a key to the entire Word of God. I'd like today to, let's see how the Bible uses the word dispensation. Now, you'll find in Hebrews, the first chapter, and we talked about that when we were there, it says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And that word worlds might give you a wrong impression if you think that the writer there was referring to the planets. The fact of the matter is, he was not referring to the planets at all. He was not even speaking of this planet on which we live. The word that he uses is the word ion. And it's a word that actually means ages. You put one age down and another age down and not age down, and it is a period of time in which God actually deals with the human race in a certain way, and then he changes that and deals with it in a little different way. And I'm sure that you recognize that Adam in the Garden of Eden was in a little different arrangement than he was when he got outside the Garden of Eden. God changed things, you see, now, that word is used not only here in Hebrews, but you'll find it used back in Matthew. And Matthew's a gospel where you need to be very careful in the way words are used. And here we are told in the 13th chapter of the gospel of Matthew, verse 38, the field is the world. Now, the field is the world. What does he mean? Well, he uses the word cosmos. I think that he means this universe we live in today, this little planet we call Earth, covered with humanity. I think that the field is the world, the whole world of humanity. That's a tremendous statement, by the way. The Lord Jesus used it. He says the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. Well, are we talking now about the cosmos, the word he used up at the top when he said the field is the world? No, this is our word ion, age. He's talking now about ages, a period of time on this earth. Therefore, at the end of the ages... And I think that he's speaking here about eternity. And that's not an age because it has no beginning and no end. Now we can see that it means a period of time. But if you hold it to just that, I think you're going to miss one of the finest understandings of the word as it's used in Scripture. It actually means really a stewardship. That's a good word for it. And it's used in Ephesians, the third chapter. Will you listen to the first two verses? For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote before in few words." Now, that is an assignment that was given to the Apostle Paul. He was to present a system, a provision God had made, a specific arrangement. And the word here is oikumene, and it means just simply that. And he amplifies this when you get down to verse 8 in this third chapter of Ephesians. And if you'll listen to it, he says here, "...unto me who am less than the least of all saints." Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? What is his dispensation? The dispensation of grace in which we live today. And he's doing something that no Jew had ever done in the Old Testament, preach grace to the nations. And several of them had preached judgment to the nations, 
but none had ever preached the grace of God to the nations. And he says, therefore, there was given to me this dispensation to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, that is, of the church, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heaven, the places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. God's revealing his love to us and giving his son to die and saving men by grace. But by that, he's revealing his wisdom to his other created intelligences. And so the epistle to the Hebrews was written to people who had been brought through a great transition. In the book of Acts, you have all that given. Peter on the day of Pentecost preaches a sermon, and it's to Israel. And the first church there was 100% Israel. But God may declare to Simon Peter that he's going to save some other folk besides just that crowd. And he sent him over to Cornelius, a Roman, a Gentile that Simon Peter had been taught to hate. He was a Gentile dog to begin with, and he was also a Roman soldier that had his heel on Israel, and that made him doubly hated. And when Simon Peter went over to preach, he said to them, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, that is the Lord Jesus, through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. Now that is something brand new. Israel had never had that before. They brought a sacrifice. That sacrifice looked to Christ. But now you receive remission of sins, not by bringing a sacrifice to the temple, but through the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, that was brand new back in those days. And this is a great transition, and the book of the Hebrews will lift us higher, I think, than any other book if we just let it. And that's the reason I'm talking about dispensations. These people had been under the Mosaic system, the law, which God had given. And they were a step ahead of a poor pagan Gentile, like your ancestor and my ancestor was. They had a long ways to come. But these people now in Hebrews are being given the superiority of Christ to everything that was in the Old Testament. Now, I come back to this subject of dispensations. Now, we've made it very clear that a dispensation is not only a period of time, but it also has to do with the method of God's dealing with mankind. And it's very easy to see that in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were under a dispensation. They were created innocent. They didn't know good from evil. And therefore, they were given a test. And that was relative to eating the fruit of a certain tree. And as we've said before, it wasn't the apple on the tree, but the pear on the ground. That was the problem. The fruit was good, and it was not an apple tree either, by the way. And obviously, when they were put out of the Garden of Eden, that was no longer a test. And you find a man following his conscience now and doing that which comes naturally as the song has it, the worldly song has it, doing that which comes naturally. And when man does that, why, he produces a world of violence, a lawlessness, and a world that we're living in right now that is tried to get rid of God's law. And therefore, conscience was not a safe leader. It led to the flood. And then man was put under human government at the time of the flood. He says, whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. In other words, when a man kills another man, that man then should make that man pay the penalty. That, by the way, is basic to all governments. And the reason that our legal system is in such a hopeless mess today is because of the fact that one basic principle is not 
put down and help to. God tried that, and of course that did not lead to a perfect race by any means. And man revealed he was incapable of ruling himself. And then God took aside a man by the name of Abraham, made a promise to him, and man held on to that promise. In fact, until the law was given. And when they became a nation, the seed of Abraham became a nation, then God gave the law at Mount Sinai. And man then was under law until the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world. And as John wrote, that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And therefore, we were then introduced to the age we are in now, the dispensation of grace. God is saving men by that means. That doesn't mean there wasn't grace under law, and it doesn't mean that there's not law under grace, as we'll see. And then after this age, there is the kingdom age. Now, you and I are living at a strategic time in the history of the world, and we need to see exactly where we are, by the way. Back of us is the law. That ended at the cross of Christ. From that day down to the present, we are under grace. After this age ends, then the kingdom will be established here upon this earth. And those are the three dispensations that concern this earth. Now, the reason that I make the book of Genesis one of the key books of the Bible is because you can't understand the first four dispensations unless you understand the book of Genesis. And then I say Matthew is another key book of the Bible, and I think probably the main key book of the Bible. And the reason for that is that you have before you the three dispensations laid before you there, and especially the one that is to come. One is past, one is present, one is to come. And I put a great emphasis, therefore, on the Gospel of Matthew. And the reason today I think there's so much misinterpretation, hopeless confusion, is because of a misunderstanding of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, again, let me say that John the Baptist said the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's John 1, 17. Now, the writer to the Hebrews directs his message to those who had been under the law. We said that in the New Testament and in the Gospel of Matthew, we are brought face to face with three dispensations, the dispensation of law and the dispensation of grace and the dispensation of the kingdom. They're all mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. You see, the Lord Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew was born a king. Matthew emphasizes that. Wise men came from the east, not seeking a savior, but one that was to be a king. And he was introduced by John the Baptist, not as a savior, but as a king. Because he began by saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you can't have a kingdom without a king. And the fact was, the great fact of that day was, the king was present. And they rejected the king, by the way. And the kingdom was, we have heard people say, postponed. It wasn't anything postponed, my friend. It all happened in the direct will of Almighty God. And so the kingdom was postponed in the sense that it's delayed and it was still in the future when you come to the end of Matthew. Now, there was the dispensation of law that these people were under at that particular time. They were going out of that dispensation of law into the dispensation of grace. And then beyond it would be the dispensation of the kingdom. You see, you have that which is past, that which is present, and that which is future. 
Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, the emphasis is upon the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the ultimate goal of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, you have three major discourses in Matthew. You have what is known as the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And that's the law of the kingdom. Unfortunately, the liberal always brought the Sermon on the Mount up to the present and said that we were living under the kingdom and the law of the kingdom, and that was Christian living. I say to you that kingdom living and Christian living are altogether two different things. And the Sermon on the Mount causes hopeless confusion if you try to put the church under it. And the reason is the church is called to a higher plane than you find here in the Sermon on the Mount. There's nothing in the Sermon on the Mount about repentance, about faith in Christ, about the work of the Holy Spirit. And apart from that, there's no such thing as Christian living, you know. Christian living is by the work of the Holy Spirit, by walking in the Spirit, by being filled with the Spirit. Now, the second major discourse is the mystery parable discourse in Matthew 13. And the key to that, I've always felt, is that woman who made bread and slipped a little leaven into it. And the leaven sure helps the taste. And believe me, the Word of God that's been given out today has a lot of leaven in it. It's sweetened to satisfy the natural man. A lot of carnal Christians like to get the bread if it's got leaven in it. And leaven is evil, always has been evil, speaks of that which is wrong. The Lord Jesus said to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and that was their doctrine. That was wrong, was evil. And you can't make leaven to be good on any condition whatsoever. But we're living in a day when evil is good and good is evil. Isaiah said we were going to have days like that, and they're around us right now, even in the church. May I say to you that the Mr. Parable Discourses show that the kingdom of heaven would exist in the Mr. Parables We're living in that period today, and there's plenty of evil being peddled around, as you well know, and it satisfies the natural man. Now, we come to the third discourse, which is the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25, and that speaks of the second coming of Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom. That's the question he's answering there. And there's nothing in the Olivet Discourse about the rapture and nothing in there that's about the church. And we'll see that a little more clearly as we uh, later on are going to come back and talk some more about these dispensations. We need to understand them, and especially if we're going to understand an epistle written to the Hebrews. And it's essential for us to understand the dispensations if we are to understand this epistle, because the people to whom it was written were under the dispensation of law. And God brought them out of that, that is, a remnant out of that system into the grace system. And also a great deal is said about the future system that is coming, and that will be the administration of the kingdom coming of the kingdom here upon this earth. I want to continue that which I began some time ago about the dispensations, that it's necessary to understand the dispensations of Scripture, and especially when we come to an epistle like we're studying now, the epistle to the Hebrews. This is an epistle that was directed to a nation that had been under law. And it was answering questions for them. 
It was saying all the way through that Israel, with all the ritual that God had given them, and he'd given them a great deal, all of that is being fulfilled in Christ now. In other words, Christ is the end of the law in the sense he's the one that the law was really pointing to. You see, God gave to Israel what we call a mosaic system. And that mosaic system was just for a period of time. I'll see that in a moment. It wasn't a permanent arrangement at all. And it was in three parts. Actually, there were the commandments. They governed Israel's moral life. And then there were the judgments, which governed Israel's civic life. And then there were the ordinances which govern Israel's religious life. And that is the way God has dealt with man. God is a holy God. He demands certain things of his creatures, and he has demanded certain things of man. And he's put him under these different economies, these different administrations, and they are actually in contrast. Law and grace are definitely in contrast. And we see that this nation that had been under that are now told that Christ is the fulfillment of everything that had gone before and that God now was saving men by what Christ had done for them. And it was very difficult, may I say to you, for them to get that. Then after the age of grace, there was to be the age of the kingdom the dispensation of the kingdom. And that kingdom is coming upon this earth. And we saw that there are those today that run ahead, but not seeing the great movement in the gospel of Matthew. They run ahead and they try to put the church under the kingdom. And we're not there yet. So that's in the future. Now, there's another group of folk. They attempt to keep us back under the law. They say there was no change of dispensation, that the law is still for today. And they, of course, like to say, well, can you break the Ten Commandments? And the very interesting thing is that if you're a child of God, you can't break the Ten Commandments because God hadn't got rid of the Ten Commandments by any means. But that's not the method of salvation for today. You can be sure of that. And so we have these different systems that have been given to mankind. And we are under this dispensation of grace today. Somebody says, well, if we're under grace, then we could break the Ten Commandments. Well, the very interesting thing is that every one of the Ten Commandments, with the exception of the Sabbath day, is mentioned in the epistles as applying to us too, you see. God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. First commandment. And we are told by Paul, We preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities, that is, idols, unto the living God. And thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And John in his first epistle 1 John 5:21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols, and thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And James wrote and said, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. And then the Sabbath day, well, that's just never been given to Christians at all. And then honor thy father and thy mother. We are told in Ephesians 6, 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And thou shalt not kill. First John three fifteen says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 